So I welcome you all to the fourth lecture of the CJNS public lecture series to be delivered today by Professor Sudipto Kaviraj, Professor of South Asian Politics and Intellectual History at Columbia University, USA. The lecture series reflected the mandate of the center, which is to focus on research on interdisciplinary issues, touching upon the disciplines of history, politics, philosophy, and sociology. The series was started by Professor Akil Belgrami, who is the Sydney Morgan Besser Professor of Philosophy and Professor Committee on Global Thought, Columbia University, who delivered the first lecture on Indian secularism and art on 6th April 2021. That was the first lecture in the series. Today, we would uh, uh, you know, conclude the lecture series by uh, the, this is the last lecture in the series. And we are really happy that we have Professor Kaviraj to speak on the search for paradise, uh, uh, a theme that he chose to speak on. I did tell him that we are focusing on uh, uh, interdisciplinary concerns and interdisciplinary issues. And I think his lecture will well reflect on these concerns with which we started the series, the CJNS interdisciplinary uh, lecture series. Now, I welcome uh, our Vice Chancellor, Professor uh, uh, Najma Akhtar, to uh, preside and chair over the session today. Professor Akhtar is a gold medalist from Aligarh Muslim University, a PhD in education from uh, Kurukshetra University, a Commonwealth Fellow for the University Administration course at the University of Warwick and Nottingham. Since uh, she's trained, and she was also trained at the International Institution Institute of Educational Planning, UNESCO Paris, she was in the faculty, controller of examinations and admissions, and director academic programs at Aligarh Muslim University. She's the founder director at State University of uh, State Institute of Educational Management and Training. Uttar Pradesh, she has anchored two books and contributed several book chapters and research papers. She led the inter international consultancy program supported by DANIDA, UNFPA, UNICEF, including the prestigious NEPA, Nepal project. She specializes in institution building, educational administration and management, distance education, education of minority, uh, uh, and minorities and educational decentralization. I welcome our Vice Chancellor, Professor Akhtar, to the public lecture here today and invite her to deliver the welcome address and chair the session. Professor Najma, please. On behalf of Jamia Millia Islamia, I welcome you all to the fourth lecture of the newly initiated CJNS Interdisciplinary Lecture Series. 2021 by the Center for Jawaharlal Nehru Studies to be delivered today by Professor Sudipta Kaviraj, Professor of South Asia, Asian Politics and Intellectual History, currently teaching at Columbia University in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies. For these lecture series, we have invited eminent public intellectuals from India and abroad to give lectures to our students and teachers on contemporary issues which need to be discussed in the public domain with an interdisciplinary focus. I must tell my guests today that this is Jamia's centenary year. We have completed 100 years of our existence and also it is Mahatma Gandhi's 150th birthday anniversary, birth anniversary. We celebrated both these events in Jamia calendar with equal fervor and enthusiasm. The association of Jamia with Mahatma Gandhi is well known and well, well recorded also. Jamia has come a long way and established itself as a prominent central university today. I am happy to announce that we have secured the first position among all central universities in the country according to the Ministry of Education ranking parameters with a score of 90% in 2020, in spite of Corona. All this has happened due to the ceaseless efforts of our students and teachers in their pursuit 
in academic excellence. We in Jamia are looking not only at the quantitative expansion by opening new and much sought after courses and more seats for students. We also seek qualitative improvement by way of empowering teachers with new updated syllabi and the state of art teaching methodologies. In the past one year, teachers have been continuously striving to improve the content of their courses and delivering them by online mode. The COVID year has taught us both the advantages and limitations of online teaching. This university has become a hub of scholars for various disciplines and therefore I, I was inviting Professor Sudipta Kaviraj to be with us uh, for some more time, for some time once the COVID is over. Through all our activities in Jamia Centenary Year, the Jamia Academic Community has paid its tribute to all the founders and builders of modern Jamia. Like all other universities, Jamia is undergoing very tough time due to the ongoing pandemic. I pay my homage to members of the Jamia faculty who had lost their lives to COVID-19. This includes several members of teaching and non-teaching staff of Jamia. Despite such unprecedented tragic events around us, we tried to keep all our commitments in Jamia calendar with regard to admissions, teaching, examinations intact. With some changes and modification, keeping the best interest of our students in mind. Online international links were also maintained through webinars and collaborative researches. Recently, it's a matter of great pride for the university that six of our research scholars have been awarded the coveted Prime Minister's Research Fellowship under the lateral entry schemes of December 2020. Five out of the six research scholars are girl students, and I hope it would inspire other girl students of the university to well in science, engineering, and research. Jamia stands for excellence and strives hard to provide its students every possible support to achieve great heights. I'm happy that we have in our midst today an eminent professor, Professor Sudipta Kaviraj from Columbia University, who is a specialist in political theory and Indian politics and has varied research interests and publication of an interdisciplinary nature. I'm very happy to welcome you, sir, to our university to give this public lecture. With this, we would like to develop deeper relationships with your department and the prestigious Columbia University. After the pandemic is over, we want to welcome you in person in Jamia to meet our teachers, researchers, and address our students. I hope you'll oblige us by doing that. My pleasure to welcome again is, Prof is Professor Rajiv Bhargava's as discussant today, who is the director of Institute of Indian Thought. On this occasion, I would also congratulate the director of the center, Professor Rumki Vasu, who has, has initiated this series of inviting public intellectuals with intellect, international interdisciplinary concerns to address our students and teachers who have immensely benefited from these enriching lectures. In these difficult times, difficult pandemic times, and I hope we'll be using these lectures again and again uh, whenever the, uh, the speaker is not there, the lecture will continue with us. <clears throat> I also welcome students and teachers of Jamia who are here today and all other others who are from different parts of the country and abroad who have joined us to listen to uh, Professor uh, Sudipta Kaviraj 
today. I welcome you all to today's lecture. And it's my pleasure to, to have you here and to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. I would now like to invite the director, CJNS, Professor Rumki Basu, who will be introducing mm -hmm. Professor Sudipto Kaviraj to the, to the audience today, who will be delivering the fourth and the last lecture in the interdisciplinary public lecture series today. The lecture is titled A Search for Paradise. Yes. Uh, Sudipto Kaviraj is a scholar of South Asian politics and intellectual history often associated with post-colonial and subaltern studies. He is currently teaching at Columbia University in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies. Shudipta Kaviraj was a student of political science at the Presidency College of the University of Calcutta. He received his PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Prior to joining Columbia University, he was a professor in politics in the Department of Politics at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He was also Associate Professor of Political Science at JNU, New Delhi. He held a visiting fellowship at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. He was a founding member of the Subaltern Studies Collective. Shudipto Kaviraj is a specialist in South Asian politics and intellectual history, as also of Indian politics. He works on two fields of intellectual history, Indian social and political thought in the 19th and 20th centuries, and modern Indian literature and cultural production. His other fields of interest and research include the historical sociology of the Indian state, and some aspects of Western social theory. He has several publications. I'll, I'll spell out the most important ones and the recent ones. Include the Imaginary Institution of India 2010, Civil Society History and Possibilities, mm -hmm. co-edited with Sunil Khilnani 2001, Politics in India, edited 1999, The Unhappy Consciousness, Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay and the formation of nationalist discourse in India, 1995. Professor Kaviraj, please, you can start. Thanks very much, uh, Rumke and uh, Professor Akhtar, for the uh, invitation to speak at Jamia. Uh, I've been, I've given several uh, lectures in Jamia over the last uh, couple of years, and they were always very interesting and uh, enjoyable locations. So I'm very thankful for you for uh, inviting me to give this lecture and also allowing me to talk about some things um, which have been of some concern for me for a long time, but it's only now that I think I've been able to think a little bit of my way through some of these questions. Um, but I wanted to st uh, start by um, remembering something that is uh, grievous. Last time when I went to Jamia physically to give those five lectures, um, I was welcomed by Karlu Savitri, who was my student at JNU. And she was gracious, she was absolutely very warm. And uh, so I feel really sad about her loss. And it's also a comment on our times, you know, where very young people leave us uh, who are much older and who are their parents, teachers, etc., to grieve over them, which is an inversion of the natural order of things. So I just wanted to mention that uh, to start. Um, I could have called this lecture Marx, Weber, and Rethinking Our Relationship with the Indian Religious Tradition. But uh, Rumki agreed with me that we should uh, choose a title, which is a more beautiful title. 
because I think a lot of the lecture today will be about that. So, um, what I shall do is, I'll start with a few initial remarks about what the question is to my mind. Then I shall focus on um, three different stages in the development of the Indic Hindu religious tradition, um, thinking about the question of paradise. I shall talk very briefly about the Kashmiri Shaivai tradition because I think they are very significant for developing a particular argument. I'll spend most of my time discussing, however, two, two forms of thinking about paradise. One, the Vaishnavas of the 15th, 16th century, who I think in some ways inverted some aspects of the Shaiva tradition. And I'll talk uh, again somewhat fully about Tagore and present to you some ideas which I did not have about Tagore before linked to the question of disenchantment. And then I'll end with some very uh, brief remark about what I shall call, you know, the half hidden paradise, which is always strewn around us in our everyday, but which we are not able to see. And it's particularly difficult to see those things during the times through which we are going. So I was attracted to Marxism when very young because I thought Marxism is a search for paradise. Paradise means essentially an improbably completely happy state for a human being, where human beings can live without suffering. So paradise for me essentially means a world which is untainted by suffering. And it's not surprise, surprising that you know young people, when we were very young, we were deeply attracted to that idea. It is not what you get in Marxism in history, but that is far more complex, and that is something that we should look at with, uh, you know, through critical examination. But I think it's also very important to establish that as the main ethical reason, ethical and imaginative reason, for us to be attracted to Marxism. So when I was very, very young, I was going to primary school, I would get up in the morning, get dressed, and wait for my bus uh, to take me to school. And just on the opposite side of the road, there was a huge garbage heap where children were exactly of my age. Uh, two or three of them would be actually rummaging through that to get things I hope not to eat, but to get things which could be sold by their families to make a living. And my attraction to Marxism was essentially because it was a kind of rejection of that world. Now, so my argument would be that, you know, paradise is not a place. I shall also argue in a minute that uh, this is not a rhetorical point. This is a serious intellectual history point because we shall see uh, when we look at very, very early stages of religious thought in our country, for instance, in the Shavar of Harsha, on the Brahma Sutra, it says quite directly that paradise is not a place. So what I'm invoking is not something which is just a rhetorical patronizing idea of a modern person you know, trying to find value in older thought. It is something which is there. So paradise is not a place, it's a way of being. And I think what I shall argue would be that when we look at our history, let us say Indian history, but this might be true of world history also generally. I think there have been two main images of paradise. One is a pre-modern image of paradise, uh, which thinks about personal lives of human beings, but about very weighty things like how to do birth, family, love, conflict, aging, death, how to do all these things well. Uh, and this was developed for millennia, mainly by religious thinkers. The second idea of paradise was constructed by mainly religious radical thinkers in the last 200 years. I was attracted to Marx, but there are others as well. But this idea of paradise is centered on social and public life. How to end suffering caused by degradation 
due to social discrimination and poverty. And uh, let me introduce a point which I will try to elaborate later on. But I think it's a crucial point from my point of view in separating off the pre-modern and the modern idea of paradise. What was lacking in the pre-modern idea of paradise, I think, is the idea uh, which I have called the idea of the plasticity of the social world. That the social world in which we live, it has a structure and therefore it has some Durkheimian property that it constrains us. It, um, it cuts off our choice. It forces us to and obliges us to work uh, in particular way. But um, it is still, in a long-term historical sense, malleable. It is plastic. It is shapeable by collective human intention and collective human effort. And, but I think I'll start by saying that if we recognize this, then we should also recognize that we are not the first or the only people who have thought about paradise, that is human life without suffering. And the people have thought about it for a very long time through, through religious thinking. And therefore, instead of building up a huge conflict between religious thought and Marxist thought or emancipatory thought, I think if we look at it this way, we shall see that we have a kind of distant kinship. I don't think we should actually try to bring it too close together. But I think in spite of the very important differences, I think we should recognize that there is something which connects the search for paradise in the pre-modern and the modern time. And in my lecture today, I shall focus essentially on pre-modern ideas of paradise in India. And uh, I must also say that you know it is very appropriate in some way that I'm giving this lecture, which is almost entirely on the Hindu tradition in an institution like the Jamia. Now, so let me turn briefly to two pages of Indic thought, very briefly. The first one is the Upanishads, also because I'll talk about Tagore later on more fully, and Tagore is deeply, deeply indebted to the Upanishads. But all that I want to note about the Upanishads here which is crucial for the world, is that the Upanishads have a view of the universe which emphasizes two things. Both these will be very important for my arg argument later. The universe impressed these people as something which is infinite, something which is infinitely complex, infinitely extended, inf infinitely renewing itself. And this infinity of the universe creates a sense of wonder in the writers of the Upanishad. And this is something which Tagore picks up quickly. But I want you to note two aspects of this sense of wonderment that any reader of the Upanishads would get. One is the, uh, the feeling that uh, here I think later thought changes a little bit. The feeling that I see in the Upanishads coming out very very strongly is the idea that because of the infiniteness of this universe, it cannot be known. And it must produce a certain sense, a certain kind of cognitive humility in us. But this sense of wonderment about the universe is expressed in two ways. One is, although it cannot be entirely known, we should try to know it. And many, many stories in the Upanishads are stories about uh, students who want to know the universe and go to a big rishi and says, tell me how we can under, how I can know this. Or if you want to shift it to something slightly different, how I can understand this. And inevitably, if you look at the different stories of the Upanishad, some of the suktas, which are not always in the Upanishad, but in the Vedic corpus, we'll see two things. One is this deep urge to know, in spite of its infiniteness, but this is the other thing which I want to emphasize much more, which is crucial to my argument today. There is also a sense of wonderment, not at its expanse, not at its complexity, but at its attendant beauty. And the beauty 
I shall explain this in a moment uh, when we come to the Kashmiri. The qualities of the universe, which cognition tries to capture, and the qualities of the universe, which aesthetic taste, our ability to see beautiful things, try to capture. You know, there are two aspects of the same thing. They are not two separate things, which can be, uh, you know, which can be separated from each other. When we turn to the Kashmiris, that is 8th to the 10th century, uh, Kashmir goes through an extraordinary efflorescence in philosophy, particularly in theology and aesthetics. I, in my judgment, they produce some of the greatest aesthetics in the history of the world. This is not the place to go into it, uh, but I wanted to mention just two things about their sense of the universe, God, and man or God, universe, and man, God, nature, and man. Um, they have a doctrine which is called the Pratyavidya doctrine. Pratyavidya means recognition. Uh, this means essentially the recognition of God in myself, which basically means the recognition of a possibility that if I refine the qualities that have been placed in me by God as my creator, then I can become one with God. I can become, become God in that sense. Not in the sense of an arrogant sense that I can become God, but I can define myself continually so that ultimately there would be no difference between God and me. So this is called Pratyavidya. I wanted to note particularly one thing about Kashmiri uh, theory. It is not accidental to my mind. I've tried to read Kashmiri aesthetic theory, not their theology very well. I cannot claim that I know their theology well. But I've spent some time trying to understand their aesthetic theory. <laughs> and I think that there's a connection between their theology and their aesthetic. It's not entirely accidental that they produce this extraordinary rasa theory uh, to understand uh, you know, the aesthetic experience of man. <laughs> because I think they want to tell us, like the Upanishads, but pushing the Upanishad argument a little bit further, that uh, what is important to know about the universe is, the, is its beauty, is its aesthetic. Aspect. And if one of the most important features of the universe is beauty, its aesthetic aspect, then the cultivation of the aesthetic faculty in man becomes, in a certain sense, the most important thing to do philosophically. So that's why I believe that there's a connection between the theology, particularly the theology of Abhinava Gupta, which is the most highly developed form of Kashmiri Shaivism, and the theory of rasa and drama that they produce at the same time. Now, uh, I wanted to make another remark about uh, the Shaiva. Aesthetic. So they basically argue that uh, they say something which is very similar to a statement that I got from one of my students at Columbia. Uh, his name is Vajdi Ben Hamed. He's from Tunisia and he's working on Islamic political thought, Islamic philosophical thought. And he gave me a very beautiful sentence from Ibn Arabi which says, among other things, that God created the, you created the world in verse. God created the world in verse. And I think what is being said here, uh, I'm simplifying it, but what is being said here is very similar to what the Kashmiris tell us. They also always invoke, there are many, many stotras to Shiva, because Shiva is the form of God. The many stotras to Shiva, which basically says that you are the Kavi of Srishti. Srishti is creation, but you are the Kavi of Srishti. Uh, instead of saying that you are the Srashta, that is, you are the creator of creation, it says that you are the poet of creation. And I would give you probably an oversimplified uh, reading of this, uh, which is something like that. that uh, yes. You know, when if we are listening to uh, a piece of music, a piece of singing which is very beautiful, we hear at least two things. We hear the note making, 
of the singer. She sings very well. She touches every note, complicated, uh, complex, uh, beautiful, builds up as a structure. But we also hear the voice. So we can say that you know, the architecture of the music in the note terms is impressive, beautiful, etc. But what a lovely voice, right? So the loveliness of the voice is something which is analytically distinct, but is always attended. It always go, goes along through with, is cons consubstantial with the, what is being presented. And I think their understanding of God is somewhat like that. The world is the result of Shiva's Jagat Kalpana, or his imagination. And imagination, this, I wouldn't have time to go into it in detail, but I think people who are Marxist, leftist, uh, uh, people interested in emancipation, should give much more interest, much more attention to the idea of Kalpana and Bhavana in the Indian uh, philosophical tradition. Kalpana is definitely poetic and aesthetic, but there is also a connection in Kalpana, imagination, between three things. That I imagine something like as an engineer imagines a house which is not yet built uh, on a space which is still an empty space, and I produce a draft of a big multi story building, it's Kalpana. Kalpana meaning it simply does not exist. It's untrue at this particular point, unreal at this particular point. But inside imagination itself, there is a power that if I can coordinate all my faculties, then I can uh, use them and gradually objectify this. This becomes from an imagination into an object. I can realize this. It becomes from unreal. It becomes real. This is also part of the process of Kalpana. And they see the creation of the world in terms of this kind of Kalpana. And, but let me make the final point about uh, the Kashmiris and then go on to the uh, Vaishnava. The Kashmiris very often believe when they are doing their aesthetic theory that art is the only place, art is the only experience which gives us an experience in mortal human life which is similar to the taste of God. The term that they use, this is the term that I am taking not from Abhinava but from uh, somebody called Vishwanath from uh, a text called Saitya Dharpana. It's very, very, very well known. It's almost a cliche. They say that, you know, the Swada of Rasa in art is Brahma Swada Sahodara. <clears throat> uh, it's a sibling to the taste of God. Brahma Swada Sahodara is, you know, brother or sister. Brahma Swada Sahodara. And they have an elaborate theory in which they say something like this, which is very beautiful, that suppose I've had a bad day in my office, I'm distracted and irritated, but I go into cinema and the cinema starts. And after 15 minutes, if the cinema is really good, then I would get into a state which they describe as Vidyantara Sparsha Sunya. Vidya is perceptible. Antara is another, that is, sparsha is touch, and shunya means absent or not there. So it says that I get into a state where I cannot perceive anything except what is going on in the screen and the artistic experience that is coming to, to me. So I'm actually cocooned in a certain sense by an experience of joy from the rest of the world, right? It's a wonderful, wonderful theory. I could go on for three hours talking about uh, the theory of the theater, but I want to draw just one one point out of this, you know, which is this idea of cocooning, separating you off from the rest of the world and separating you off in a bubble, which is the bubble of intense and unmixed joy, unmixed rapture. So when we look at the theater, when we listen to music, when we read great poetry, that is the state we are in. But there's a very big problem. This is the crucial point of my lecture today. The problem is 
that we cannot experience God in that sense in the human life. This is the nearest that we come to the experience of God. But this is transient, this is short-lived, this can happen only in art. It does not actually go beyond art. And so therefore, in spite of developing this wonderful theory of artistic creation and artistic rapture, the Kashmiri theory still believes that the task of human life is to do religious refinement of the self, artistic, ethical refinement of the self, which tries to uh, improve us ethically, aesthetically, etc. But ultimately, this human life is essentially a veil of tears. And we can be one with God uh, after death, right? And so we should try to be one with God in that sense. But you cannot be one with God in this world, except for saints and yogis, etc., who might be able to do it. So transcendence, you know, this is a strong idea of transcendence. But the idea of transcendence is placed outside the world. So it produces a tremendously powerful aesthetic theory, but this is a, this world, a, a, the otherworldly religion, not this worldly, sorry, otherworldly religion in the sense of the term. I would argue later on that you know we should not necessarily use terms taken from from Weber, but this is something for which we have Indic terms as well. In fact, Aihika, which is of this world, and Anaihika or Paralokika, which is the, of the other world. So this is the a, a religion of the other world, paradise which which we should aim at achieving is other world. Now let me turn to the Vaishnava. Um, the Vaishnavas do an extraordinary thing. They absorb, if you look at two of their greatest theological texts, very technical, um, Bhakti Rasamrita Sintu and Ujjwala Nilamani. What is astonishing is the extent to which the Vaishnavas ingested completely the huge architecture of Rasa theory that the Kashmiris had developed. But they put it to a completely different use because the Kashmiris never thought that Bhakti is a Rasa. There are nine Rasas which are quite well known, but Bhakti was never conceived as a Rasa by the Kashmiris. So they think that Bhakti is a Rasa and the task of human life is to achieve Bhakti. So what is Bhakti? My argument would be that you know, what the Vaishnavas do is to make a crucial change in the conception of Swarka, the conception of a human life without suffering. The earlier thinking is that there cannot be a human life without suffering in this world. You should try to live as perfectly as you can, but ultimately a life without suffering must wait for, the, for the, this world, otherworldly paradise. I think what the Vaishnavas do is an extraordinary transformation of religious thought. And I think it has a connection with my later argument that it is because of that there is no disenchantment in India. The process which is called disenchantment in European history did not happen in India. We should not be deluded by Weber through excessive respect for Weber to look for disenchantment everywhere and then be disappointed that it hasn't happened to us. But I think the reason it hasn't happened to us has something to do with this big Vaishnava transformation. So the Vaishnavas, I'll give you an example of what the, of what the Vaishnavas try to do to a song. There's a song which is sung by very simple but beautiful words, sung by Pandit Jatraj uh, from, uh, I think, uh, probably North Indian or Marathi poet called Parmananda Das. And first, I'll uh, give you the uh, the words of the song. The words of the song are "Kaha karu Baikuntha me jai." You know, Baikuntha is swarga. Baikuntha is actually the exact Vaishnav equivalent of the Shaiva understanding of paradise. The Vaishnavas also in the pre Gaudiya Vaishnava, you know, the pre medieval period 
thought of Svarga exactly the same way. And Svarga for the Vaishnava is called Vaikuntha. Vaikuntha is the place where Vishnu lives, right? And they do an enorm enormous amount of thinking about thinking through the idea, what does it mean to be one with God? And they have five different meanings of one with God, of being one with God, Sayuja, Salokya, Sarukya, etc. I would not go into that. But that is Vaikuntha. And Vaikuntha is otherworldly. These people are actually trying to leave Vaikuntha. They are saying that we do not want to live in Vaikuntha. So the song is, Kya karu, kaha karu, Vaikuntha mein jai. What shall I do by going to Vaikuntha? Jaha nahi nanda, jaha nahi yashoda. Where I do not have the warm human relationship of parents, right? Or of, of the father's world. Jaha nahi yanda, naha nahi yashoda. Yahanahi Gopi, of course, where I do not have lovers, individual lovers. Gopi, Gwalana, that is, uh, you know, the, the children who are Krishna's friends. Gwalana Gai, the cattle. It's very important to have the cattle around with you. Jahanahi, Jala Jamuna Ke Niramana. Jaha nahi kadamba kechhaya. And then it says that uh, I do not want to go to Vaikuntha. I want to stay in Vrindavan. So he is introducing an idea of Vrindavan as an alternative conception of Swarga, opposed to Vaikuntha, directly saying that I do not want to go to Vaikuntha. I want to stay in Vrindavan. What is Vrindavan? Vrindavan is essentially the fundamental human relationship, but notice human in a complex and extended way. All these are human relationships. The relationship with my parents, the relationship with my lover, the relationship with my friends, the relationship with the animal world, and the relationship with the natural world, Jamuna and uh, Kadamba. And I want to mention just two points about this a bit more. Yamuna, I think it's in my Bengali essay, I have written a long essay in Bengali about that. I have a long section, glossing the section of Jala Jamuna ke Niramala, where I argue that, uh, you know, Niramala is not Amala. Niramala is not water which has not been dirtied. It's not water which has not been polluted. It's water which has been the, the water is actually the river of human life, which has been polluted. There's no way in which you can uh, have this water which is unpolluted. But it is water from which pollution has been taken away. It has been near, I'm using the uh, prefix ne more strongly to say that you know, it is something which purifies our life. And that is why, you know, the water of the Yamuna is not like the water of the Ganga. So it does not purify in the ritual sense. It purifies in a particular sense. What is the sense in which it can purify our life? It can purify our life by our becoming attentive to relationships of love. And so I want to argue briefly that the traffic in this, you know, in the traffic of the relationship between human beings and God, it's just the, in the opposite direction. In earlier theory, the traffic is all from, uh, you know, debased, degraded earth to a heaven, which is the place of transcendence. And this actually reverses the, the traffic. It says that uh, paradise in the older sense is boring. We have nothing to do. And so we should leave paradise and come to Vrindavan which is the real world, but in an unreal state. It's a real world from which suffering has become absented. And you can absent the suffering by conscious effort. That is what the Vaishnava should try to do. And um, so uh, we're not really surrounded by people. We are also surrounded by objects. And the whole point in this Vaishnava reconfiguration of religious thought is to say that we should seek to surround us with objects of beauty. 
Muslims are not unaware of this change or unwilling to participate in this new aesthetic. I would request you to hear a song which uh, I really admire. Uh, there's uh, Farid Ayaz, the uh, Kavali singer. He sings a song which says, Kanhaya, uh, Yad hai kuch bhi hamari. And you will see what is very interesting about that song is that, you know, it is also a totally Muslim song. Because at the end, it says to Krishna, Mai kon hu or kya hu, ye rizwan se pucha. So it is entirely within the theology of Islam that it's able to incorporate this from uh, this manner of thinking. So let me make another point very quickly and then go to Tagore. Uh, Lunki, how long do, you, do I have? I think you could take uh, half an hour more. Okay. Or maybe oh, that, 20 that, minutes. That's much more, more than I, I don't need so. Uh, okay. But let I me make to, one, one quick point to about this uh -huh. thing. What does it mean to surround us with beautiful things? You know, beautiful relations, of course. But I think beautiful things, the thingness, the emphasis on things is important. We should surround us with beautiful things. But to do that, we need not have a palace to live in. We need not have very expensive things to buy. And this is what we need to do. And I think this is also something for which the Vaishnavas had such a huge influence on ordinary people. I'll do something which is slightly frivolous, so you should bear with me. I'll give an example in my Bengali essay also. I have a section which is called, uh, which is about uh, a bed cover. I have a bed cover which was presented to me in a deeply Vaishnava place. I went to Bhuvaneshwar and uh, I, was I was presented that as a gift. It's a cotton bed cover. It's unimaginably beautiful. And if you go into an Utkalika shop anywhere or uh, an Orisha Emporium shop, and ask them to show you the saris and the bed covers, etc. You are immediately astounded by, you know, the 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 plenty of beautiful things. I want you to notice something about that. You know, that bed cover is red, and it has a cream design, and the cream design has two predominant motifs, three predominant motifs. It has the motif of a shankha, that is a conch shell combined with uh, tendrils, you know, lata, and flowers, right? Now, what is strange about it? What I find very powerful about this is that, you know, the weaver who produces this, this bed cover, he has been asked to to tamper with, in a sense, you know, to interfere with God's creation, to see himself as a co-creator with God in a certain sense, and do something which even God has not been able to do, because the conch shell is found on the seashore, you know, half hidden in the sand, and the flower is on a tree where it might be half hidden by leaves and things like that. What he does is he takes this. This is the work of imagination. He takes those two things from nature. He makes them perfect through his imagination. And then he puts them together in a way which even in God's world, it was not possible to do. You do not have a creeper with uh, flowers on this issue. And you do not have conscious, you know, hanging from trees or hanging from creepers. But this is something which is a human being which endowed with Kaltana, which is the Shakti of Shiva or Vishnu or Krishna, whatever you want to call it, endowed with the power which he shares with God, can do. And what it does to me is that, as I said, I don't have to live in a palace. Suppose I live in a stuffy room in Calcutta, and I get up in the morning, and there's only a small slice of sunshine which comes into my room. It's a dingy room. I get up in the morning, and I make my bed. So I bring order 
into something which was disorderly. And then when I take this bedsheet and I swing this bedsheet in the air, you know, and then stretch it on the bed, you know, it's essentially an intimation to me, telling me the first thing in the morning that do not forget that the world is full of beautiful things. And you must be able to stitch them together to, to beautify your life. You know, so there is happiness that you can can get, but you have you must have the eye to see it. First, the eye to see it in reality, and then the extended eye of the imagination to see how you can do better than God, like this weaver has then has done better than God. So I think this is how the Vaishnavas developed their argument. I note I want you to note three things about this. First of all, it inverts the relationship between paradise and earth. Vrindavan is not by contrast. Vrindavan is this world in disguise. Under under not under a different name. It's not just a name. You cannot simply give it a name and it becomes Vrindavan. It is a it is a different condition for which you have to strive, right? But it is that. Secondly, it is something which actually stretches from um, big acts like philosophers writing big books like Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, but is also there in the work of the humblest craftsman, like the weaver who is weaving a bed sheet, uh, the weaver who is weaving a sari, which will be worn by people, you know, all the time. And all the time you are wrapped around in a sari, remember that for reminding yourself of what is available to you in the universe. And the third point is that I'm not surprised that because of this, that any place into which this religion enters, it breaks out in the most extraordinarily artistic revolution in terms of poetry, music, dance, and painting. Right. So my basic argument to this point is that we should periodize our religious history in our own terms. And this is a point which is somewhat like the European Renaissance, where there's a kind of, um, in a pivoting, there's a kind of redirection of religious thought towards a kind of, you know, profound disworldliness. And I think it is this which actually leads to, uh, and this world is still with us. I occasionally discuss this with um, Rajiv uh, Alok Rai, whom I found in the audience. Uh, quite often, I think that if even if you look at the the lyrics and the tunes, etc., of Hindi film music of the 1950s and 60s, you will see the longevity of this artistic order. I think up to the 1950s, 60s, Indians did not have a language of expressing love, which could break out of the template which was created by the Vaishnava in that time. Let me now turn to the word very quickly. I would argue, let me do it very briefly. I shall argue that Tagore drew upon the Vaishnavas very heavily, but he also mixed it with elements of modern thought. Um, the crucial idea that he takes from the old Indic tradition is the idea of Kalpana, which I mentioned just now, which he uses repeatedly in his philosophical thinking about the world. So his world, Tagore's world is like this, that you have a God who creates this world, but who also has left an intimation of his presence in every little thing in this world. And so you have God, you have nature, and you have human beings. Nature has two types of presence in Tagore. One is, uh, this is an argument I would ask you to note uh, a bit more attentively. Uh, nature is beautiful in two different ways. There are certain parts of nature which are naturally beautiful. The mountains are beautiful, the sea is beautiful. So in search of beauty, you could go there. But nature is also beautiful in a second sense, which is very important for Tagore, which is that nature does self-decoration. I would use in Bengali, it's much easier because I can use a very beautiful word that nature can nature does shringar. 
You know, Shingar means decoration, that is self decoration, uh, you know, wearing a, uh, you know, wearing a bangle or wearing something on your ear, etc., uh, building is the decoration, um, Shingar. But Shingar also means erotic, you know, Shingar uh, means uh, erotic love. So nature does this kind of shingar from time to time. So when spring comes, there's something like this. When you do not have an ordinary night, but you have a full moon night, that is shingar. So there are particular times when nature actually breaks out in unordinary beauty. right? And the important thing for Vaishnavas and for Tagore, for both of them, I think, very deeply, if you ask the question, why does nature do this? Nature does this for both groups of uh, both of them to remind human beings of their obligation and responsibility to seek love and affection and beauty, which they forget all the time because of the you know this is the this is why the metaphor of Yamuna is so interesting that you know the water is not unpolluted water; the water is sometimes deeply polluted water. But the thing is that you can make that water Yamuna, you can make that water Niramal by doing that. You know, this is the activity that you have to do. So nature had these two uh, states of, be of being beautiful. And these are all, all, all the time, always a reminder to the human being of the life without suffering, which is attainable to them which is available to them, for which they have to have the eye to see. And it's poetry, music, etc., which can give them that eye, right? So, um, to make that point very quickly, <coughs> why do I say that Tagore does not accept disenchantment? This is the crucial social theory, political theory point. I thought for a long time that Tagore accepts what Weber says that the development of science divests you know, the world of beauty and meaningfulness and charm, enchantment. So the world becomes inevitably disenchanted. I thought that Tagore accepted that. And then he was saying that, no, but in spite of that, we need not give in to that. We did not surrender to that. We can re-enchant the world by art. That's what I thought. Let's say just about two years back. But reading the Bhashava stuff, you know, the Bhaktara Samrita Sindhu and Puchwarani Ramana, I have now revised my opinion. I now believe that what Tagore is saying is this. Of course, he is deeply influenced by Dee's conception of the universe, that there is a God who has created the world but does not interfere in the world. Right? He has left the world to permanent <coughs> laws. But um, science unravels these laws. Science actually shows us the complexity uh, of this infinite world. The point where Tibor disagrees with European thinking is that he does not accept that the growth of science necessarily disenchants the world. So let me tell you why I think he does not, uh, through, again, a frivolous example. Suppose I'm sitting next to the river here, it's not very far from my house, uh, on the river bank in the afternoon, and I see the sunset, which is very beautiful. I could also do that, you know, from the roof of my house in Calcutta, in a dingy place. But I, I look at the, the sunset, and I see the sunset as very beautiful. But one day, I have a scientist sitting next to me, and I tell him that, you know, can you explain to me why the sun, which is which gives me a sort of even, you know, ordinary, basically white light the whole day, why does it suddenly change for 15 minutes or half an hour at the end of the day into such beautiful red color? And he gives me a complete scientific explanation of why it turns red. I think Tagore asks, and we should ask with Tagore to Weber, why should this 
lead to a situation where from the next day I would not see it, I won't be able to see it as beautiful. How does it follow? I don't think Tagore accepts that it follows from that. And if you do not think that it follows from that, then you can go back to the point that I made initially from the Upanishads, but is more developed in the Kashmiri. That when you say that I want to understand this world, right? Understanding immediately splits into two activities. One activity is the activity of cognition. I want to understand, that. I want to know how it happens. The other meaning of understanding is like tasting, right? So if somebody gives me a whole truckload of ice cream, I cannot finish the whole truckload of ice cream. So I, don't, I cannot know the truckload of ice cream exhaustively, cognitively. But I can taste it. And tasting it, you know, an aesthetic understanding of something is also a crucial, important, you know, essential part for understanding of the universe. So Tagore's argument, therefore, would be if you look at Tagore's songs in the puja cycle, the prakriti cycle, and the brain cycle, you can bring them together to make this point that it is not that he thinks that the world is disenchanted and we can re-enchant it. He refuses to take the argument that because of the development of science, the world is disenchanted. He is full of respect for modern science, but he believes that the more modern science actually shows us the infinity of the universe, the more our imaginative activity is activated, is elicited. We uh, see it as beautiful side by side with that. So I do not, uh, I think what Tagore is saying, we should uh, think about it. I'm not saying that you should necessarily agree with it. So the knowing the universe has two meanings, the cognitive meaning of knowing and the aesthetic meaning of knowing. And he doesn't see why the understanding of causality must dispel the sense of beauty. So he seeks to develop a picture of human habitation in nature where his vastness and complexity prompts wonder, but also appeals to our aesthetic taste. So let me finish now in a couple of minutes. Um, so we should not be surprised that the world that we see around us is not the world which, which troubles people. We do not live in a world with disenchanted. When we go out into the world, we see temples not abandoned like European churches, full of people. And there is a kind of everyday religiosity which surrounds us. But I want to finish with just one point about a non-everyday form of religiosity, which is part of the search for paradise. I'll give you an example from the Dula Puja in Kolkata. I went to Kolkata after a very long time, after 40 years, to see the Dula Puja. I think about 10 years ago. And I want to know just two things very quickly. Um, the first point was that, um, you know, of course, it was very, very, very crowded, uh, impossible to stop when you were going to see a book. And I found that there were very few people, and the crowd was predominantly uh, a crowd of youth very young people, others also, but you know, a very large number of youth who have come to, to the puja. But I noticed, I told Nilajana that, you know, what is remarkable is, very few people were actually stopping in front of the image and doing something like this. You know, first of all, you don't get time to stand there and then to bow your head. You are being carried in an unstoppable stream of people. But even then, you know, earlier people would have actually done something like this and then being carried away by the crowd. But no one was doing that. People were much more interested in taking selfies with the, uh, with the image rather than doing uh, a bow to the image. Then I told myself that, you know, I'm being silly. This is how I put it in my Bengali essay. They have not come there to meet the goddess. They have come there to meet themselves, and a part of their self, uh, a part of their self which comes out only in certain occasions of festivity. You know, so the girl who has come from a suburban place into Calcutta, 
Nushiyas come there to meet that self of ours, which is fulfilled to every particle, you know, with a certain kind of transient joy. It's not something that she would be able to hold on to forever, right? And so she, and why should that not be, you know, part of a very valuable experience? I'm not going into whether it is religious or not. Of course, it's religious. It's part of the Yuga But I'm much more interested in that, that, you know, being with others is also being with yourself in a totally elevated time, you know, which is the time of joy. And I'll finish by another example that I saw in Kolkata. You know, Kolkata, as you, as you know, I come from Kolkata. Kolkata is a dirty city. Kolkata is disorderly, it's crowded. It's, uh, in many places, it's quite dismal. But <coughs> what is interesting is that in the evening, when the night falls, the people who are in the Durga Puja committees, they realize along with, like my we are, you know, who is the creator of beauty, whom we ignore, like my we are, you know, there are two groups of people, people who make these mandaps, you know, the, what in Bengali we would call the pandals, and the pandals, pandals are miraculous, you know, with bamboo and sheets of cloth, they can produce the White House. I actually saw a South Indian temple in the middle of a, middle of a park in in uh, in Salt Lake. So let me make two remarks about that. You know, so what was it? In fact, what they created, the, what I find very interesting is that there are people who see an opportunity in in the night, you know, the, in the darkness. They use the darkness like a palette. You know, you cannot see the rest of Calcutta. You can paint on that palette. With, with lights, you know, which is done by, uh, you know, half-employed electrician boys who hang around the para all the time, in the rest of the rest of the year, you know, with their help, the people who produce the pandal, they produce a paradise. And they said the turn of that South Indian temple stays there for five days. We know that after five days, this world would disappear. But my question is, can you say that that world is not real? Of course, for five days, it is real. You can actually go and stay inside it. You can touch it. Right? You can take it down. So how can you take it down if it's not real? Of course, it is real. But it doesn't have the power of reality, which can turn you know, the ordinary sordidness that you see in a city life in India into something which is permanent to beauty. So, but I see that as the search for paradise. So let me uh, end by saying that, you know, I think my general conclusion is that, let me make one uh, final remark about Marxism. In what I've talked to you today, there has been very little reference to Marxism. Because, as I said, that's a different way of understanding the paradigm, which is also very, very, I think, in some ways, even more important. But I just wanted to end by saying that uh, as human beings, we're not very good at doing paradise. But at the same time, I think probably we are making a mistake. It's a simple one, simple mistake. We want a paradise usually in our thinking that is whole and complete with all its parts present at the same time. But in a human life, uh, we live a life which has denied that to us. We can never create it whole in that sense. But at the same time, there are small, unfinished, and unrecognized fragments of paradise in our life in every sense. So these fragments are always strewn around us, affection of family, friends people we love, sudden occasional kindness that you get from people, unexpected beautiful objects that you find in a shop or pick up from the street or see on a sunset. So seeking paradise means an attempt not to lose them and to try to stitch them together and to try to hold on to them, always failingly, because you know we cannot hold on to them permanently. 
uh, securely ever. But I think we should not ignore the fact that such small events happen to us all the time, but big events do as well. Epochs come to an end and others begin. Oppressive systems fall to the ground and shatter. And these are the unrecognized parts of the paradise in our lives. And so I conclude by the thought that in a human world, paradise is never fully attained, but in a different sense, it is never lost. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, we have among us today, Rajiv, uh, Professor Rajiv Bhargav, who is a political theorist and director, Institute of Indian Thought, Center for the Study of Developing Societies. Professor Bhargav is a noted political theorist. He will share his observations and give his comments on the lecture. Professor Bhargav has held professorships and given his and will give his comments on the lecture today. Professor Bhargav has held professorships at several universities, including the Jawaharlal Nehru University, the University of Delhi, and he has since 2005 been with the Center of Center for the Study of Developing Societies, CSDS. He is currently an honorary fellow at CSDS and the director of its Parik Institute of Indian Thought. He was also the director of the center from 2007 to 2014. He has an he is an honorary fellow, Belial College, Oxford. He has been a fellow at the Harvard University, Columbia University, University of Bristol, Institute of Advanced Studies, Jerusalem, Wissenschaftskolleg Berlin, and the Institute of Human for Human Sciences, Vienna. From 2014 to 2018, he was a professorial fellow at ACU Sydney and Bergudin Fellow at Stanford, NYU, and Tsinghua Universities between 2015 and 2017. Internationally renowned for his work on secularism and methodological individualism, some of his publications include Individualism in Social Science, 1992. What is political theory and why do we need it? 2010 and the promise of India's secular democracy 2010. Professor Bhargav, I invite you to share your comments on the lecture delivered today by Professor Sudipto Kaviraj titled A Search for Paradise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ethi. Um, and thank you, Sudipto, for uh, that marvelous lecture. Uh, I can see. I can see myself agreeing with you on on uh, where exactly to search for paradise. Uh, not in a radically transcendent world, and not in the world uh, which we normally experience, but uh, a world that is available to us here and now occasionally. Uh, and um, so, uh, yeah, by and broadly, I agree with, with you. Uh, but I, I will, uh, since I've heard your uh, full lecture, I'll take this opportunity to speak a little more on, on this theme and uh, on, on, uh, on, the, on the way you presented it. So I, I think, uh, one of your propositions is that uh, uh, both uh, religious persons and radical social thinkers, uh, including Marxists, share a concern with human suffering and agree that they deserve a, a better life than they currently have. They disagree on how to achieve this goal, but despite that, they could form a coalition of sorts, uh, at least uh, among those who take uh, their respective convictions and judgment seriously. And I, I couldn't agree more with you on this. Uh, I myself have been looking for such an alliance between secular uh, and religious uh, believers and practitioners uh, ever since I started to work on secularism. Uh, my, my own ideas on secularism have never been uh, anti-religious. Uh, they've always had uh, ways of accommodating religion. Uh, uh, 
I think it's also widely assumed that secularists believe in just one world, the one here and now. And while the religious take cognizance of this world, uh, the one here, which is here and now, they really believe in a world which is beyond uh, the here and now, in some other world. In other words, they, ontologically speaking, they duplicate the world. But that, of course, is not quite true of, uh, uh, of I mean, there are a lot of pagan religions, uh, religions with primary cultures that have believed in just one world, uh, this world. And there are secularists who believe in two worlds. And Marxists certainly believe in two worlds. Uh, the one as it exists here and now, and the other which will exist uh, at some later time. Uh, and and here it's it's since they talk about rupture and revolution, they introduce the idea of <clears throat> of radical transcendence. Uh, so radical secularists and in those who believe in uh, what we might call following Jean Asman's secondary religions, uh, most of the Abrahamic uh, religions and religions which have been influenced by by Abrahamic religions, including Hinduism, uh, uh, they both share uh, ideas of radical transcendence, that is to say, the capacity to step back and look beyond and see the widest possible schism between how things currently are and what they can be at their best uh, if, if the full potentialities uh, of uh, the world of humans were realized uh, with or without the help of God. Uh, now, radical ref self-reflexity and transcendence, it what is primarily captured by the idea of an axial age, uh, which Sadhupta, you spoke about. Now, I, I kind of slightly disagree on, on when exactly it is to be located in India. Uh, uh, you talk about it uh, as as being located in uh, during the uh, period of Kashmiri Shaivism. I think the idea of transcendence has been there much earlier. It's there in some form in the Upanishads, but certainly the idea of epistemic transcendence is present. Radical epistemic transcendence is already present in Buddhism, but that of course is uh, not uh, the issue. The point is that. Uh, is that uh, both uh, uh, secularists and 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 some religious people, certainly those which are post axial, they speak of liberation in some other world, uh, and and that is to do liberation has to do with the end of suffering, uh, and and so here again I I agree uh, with you, and and therefore both. When they when they think of that other world, which is totally free of suffering, they are thinking of uh, some idea of paradise, of heaven or swarga, whether in this world or the next. Uh, in passing, however, I, I must add that both religious and these secular people who believe in radical transcendence have produced immense human suffering. In achieve in trying to achieve their professed goals, but that is a matter which I would leave uh, for some other occasion. Uh, I'd like to just uh, say that, uh, I, I, and I agree with Siddhartha that uh, Marxists should attend to uh, religious ideas uh, of paradise. Uh, they should take them more seriously. Um, uh, 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 yeah. So so so. I I have my agreement on so many things, uh, but but there is another interesting feature that you note and uh, and which is extremely important. You speak about images of paradise rather than conceptions, and this is a very important distinction because one of the greatest blunders of post-axial thinkers, accentuated hugely by Western modernity, is excessive attention on the theoretic. A mode of uh, cognition at the cost particularly of the mythic and the mimetic. Each of these three are very crucial human modes of grasping reality. And mimetic thinking is largely practical, but also depends on images 
because what you have to do in order to learn something uh, by imitation, uh, which is very central to, to mimesis, is that you practice what you want to learn by enacting it uh, either performatively or imaginatively in your images. Uh, and you don't need language for that. And, and, and so images are extremely important uh, in mimetic thinking, but also, of course, in mythic thinking, which uh, brings in language, but depends equally on, 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 on images. Now, the, the, the idea of you know, a certain kind of modernist idea is that uh, the, the theoretic supersedes both these modes of grasping reality and that it is superior to both these modes of grasping reality. Uh, and uh, that we should strive for achieving a theoretic understanding because that alone uh, will give us uh, a purchase on controlling uh, the world, and which is absolutely necessary for transforming it. And, and so uh, I, 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 this is something which is a flaw of, of, uh, of Western modern thinking. Uh, not to be able to give theoretic a proper place in our cognitive map, but to give it uh, not only an a, an overriding uh, place, but to think of it as much more superior to the other. And 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 uh, and I think by by putting your emphasis on images and and going to the pre-modern and to the religious, I think uh, you are uh, uh, taking a step in the in the right direction. As a matter of fact, we know, and this is good, as, you know, modern thinkers know that uh, our uh, theoretical thinking is suffused by metaphors, by models, by analogies, and by images. Uh, so there, there is already, uh, you know, good scientists know this, good social scientists know this, uh, and, and uh, but but of course the 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 the, the entrenched modern uh, uh, mode of thinking puts uh, uh, more much more premium on 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 the theoretic uh, and 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 I think it's very important that we we don't do that and and therefore to draw a drop on religion is 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 is, is, is extremely important. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm not surprised because of this excessive reliance on the theoretic that there are very few modern images of paradise and a few secular images of paradise, uh, except for the romantics, uh, which uh, you didn't actually explicitly talk about romantics uh, uh, in the, the romantics, but in your in your words, uh, when you brought in uh, the idea of enchantment, enchant, enchant yeah, uh, Enchantment and and uh, on on reenchanting the world. I think uh, there is a lot of influence of that. Uh, when you talk about the importance of kalpana, uh, that's extremely important because you know kalpana or imagination is what liberates humans from the bondage to the to the to what is available to them, uh, and to get access to something which they believe is more real in some ways. Uh, and which is not immediately available to experience, and and uh, we have also, you know, modern conception of reason has also have also tied us much more to the world, uh, to grasp this world as it is, and and uh, modern conception of reason also, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, cut themselves off from imagination, uh, and uh, and that is again being to the detriment of. Of uh, certain, uh, you know, ways of uh, uh, of uh, of uh, imagining uh, uh, the future uh, and and therefore a paradise and and uh, and uh, so I think I think all this uh, which you are trying to do in this paper is extremely interesting and extremely important. Uh, I, I you know. I, I said that secular people don't really talk about paradise. Uh, of course, they hint at it. They, there is always a little bit of gesture towards them. I mean, you remember, you know, of the phrases. I mean, naya zamana, 
वो सुबह कभी तो आएगी नया दौर दिस इज जेस्टरिंग टू समथिंग एंड ऑफ कोर्स यू रिमेंबर टॉक ऑफ द न्यू मैन व्हिच वाज वेरी मच देयर इन मॉडर्न मार्क्सिस्ट सॉर्ट ऑफ ह्यूमनिज्म बट आई थिंक देयर इज वेरी लिटिल यू नो वेरी लिटिल सब्सटेंस टू इट Uh, let me come immediately to another thing which you say uh, which is uh, that the, the idea of paradise is is more of you know you say mode of it's a mode of being and it's not a place uh, and i think uh, this this uh, distinction that you draw may be overdrawn uh, because mode of being is mode of being in the world and you know it is whether it's this world or some other world and in fact when you talked about about uh, uh vision of thinking uh, have you talked about an earthly paradise which is uh, which is there in vrindavan so which has got a very precise location so the place has always been pretty important uh, uh but i would say yes a, a certain mode of being in in a place embodied somewhere uh, is is extremely uh, crucial um if you look at now uh, if you uh, but what are the you know it's very interesting that uh, in in medieval christian uh, thinking uh, you know the the search for paradise was always a search for a particular place uh, a, a lot of people thought that the garden of eden which of course is linked to paradise was located in mongolia many many medieval thinkers thought that it was located in ethiopia and and lo and behold a, a very large number of people and i guess even somebody like christopher columbus thought that paradise located is located in india and uh, there are a lot of christian uh, medieval christian works where uh, uh, people uh, people have tried to argue well not argue but people have tried to uh, to say something to the effect that the the more east you go the more likely you will get to paradise and the and more, the more west you go the more likely you come to the absence of paradise uh, and i think uh, the medieval medieval christian thinkers had uh, uh, had uh, had something uh, uh, right about that except that uh, they didn't know how perverse uh, the impact of the west will be on on the rest of us uh, and how horribly uh, it will have that impact uh, uh, on us uh, but let me just uh, say uh, something more about uh, the sense of paradise you know the the idea of what paradise is uh, and here i think we find uh, you know a lot of suffusion a lot of mixing of uh, secular and religious thinking i think the uh, we, we there is the, the the transcendence the the separation between the two is virtually you know non existing i think the is the secular imagery is so much a part of of uh, or uh, I, uh, of of uh, of the images uh, of paradise whether it is jewish or christian or early vedic uh, you know ideas of varg, uh, swarga uh so so in the jewish christian and even later the islamic imagination uh I, I, i'm sure many of you know that the word paradise itself is from old persian it's a persian word uh and it's of course present uh, currently in the form of firdaus uh, uh but but uh, it's it the sense of this was a walled city uh, an enclosure a garden uh and these are of course the great images of the kingdom of god the city of god the garden uh, the, 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 the 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 garden of eden uh, and 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 so what they do is that they see a certain part of the world this world and uh some features which they find despicable they 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 talk of it as what the real nature of the world is so it's sinful fallen it's full of suffering and there are other aspects of the world which you know are beyond them 
but which they have seen uh, stealthily, uh, which, uh, which they've seen other people enjoy stealthily, which they take to be available to everybody in the next world. So all the delights are available in the next world or, you know, or perhaps everybody had it at one time, but they lost it and they will regain it. And, and here, when you look at all the features that are described either in Christian or in Islamic imagination, it's like, you know, well, it's, it's a place without, uh, without war, without weapons. It's the, it's the fine, it's, it's, it's where angels will walk you through the gates. Uh, flowing rivers and springs, purest of water, milk and honey, uh, you know, great mansions uh, in the Quranic imagination, rich carpets. Uh, in the Again, in, in, in the Quran, the, a cup full of wine will be available to you. And in Christianity, is mountains of wine. And again, all kinds of meat and fruit and gold bracelets and pearls and green garments of silk. Uh, no dry river beds. Uh, I mean, it's all earthly, you know, it's it's an earthly paradise, uh, which is projected onto the mother world. But you can see that there is no real imagination uh, required, I mean, uh, to to uh, to 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 uh, to talk of it. I mean, I, I, I'm uh, Lorenzo de Medici. I'm just going to quote him. Uh, it's, it's paradise means nothing other than a most pleasant garden abundant with all pleasing and delightful things, trees, apples, flowers, fresh running water, and the song of the birds. So really, I mean, it's, uh, this is the, uh, and so, I mean, what you talk, when you talk about leaving Vaikuntha and coming to Brindavan, what you get, of course, is, I mean, what is radically different here is that, uh, is the simplicity of Vrindavan and the emphasis on, on human relationships. Whereas what you find in the other uh, 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 religious imaginations is uh, abundance of, of things, of, of course, things of beauty, but abundance, no scarcity. Uh, there is also community, uh, you know, uh, that's also there, but, but of course, uh, it's, it's a, it's an idealized version of of something, whereas in 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 the in in your what I, what I get from your talk and Vrindavan is something uh, which is uh, uh, just a different way of looking at our current relationships, and I think that is that is extremely important. It's not as you said, it's not a palace. It's a very simple place, and that is important. But I think the and, and I'll just come. I'm I think I was asked to speak for twenty five minutes. I've got about three four minutes left. Uh, and at the end, I'll talk about one um, uh, view, uh, which is neither religious nor philosophical. It sort of transcends that boundary, and that's the Buddhist view. And I think that gives us a very different idea. I think, to be to be, to be very honest, is this is one uh, way of uh, thought or philosophy where there is no cons no image of a paradise. You know, there is there isn't a paradise, earthly or non-earthly. Uh, non-world, this worldly or otherworldly. I mean, the, the nirvana is basically, if you go to the root of uh, nirvana, as you know, uh, I'm sure so that, so it's basically, it's, it's to go out and to be extinguished, uh, to, be, to, to blow out nirvana. That's what it means. And, and, and the image is not really that of a, although Buddha sometimes speaks like that, the image is not of a, of a flame being extinguished by a gust of wind, but rather an image uh, of a flame being extinguished slowly because it is running out of fuel, and then it suddenly slowly disappears and into into nothingness, and and that's that kind of cessation is a nibbana, and that's what you're striving for. Now that of course is very different. I mean that's a that is radical difference, I think. It's very different from the Vedic, from the Upanishadic. It's very different from the Jew, from the Christian and the Islamic, probably from the Jewish as well. Uh, but of course, the, the last uh, point, I mean, joy. You talked about joyful existence. And I think there, there is an image uh, that the Buddha offers of, of a certain kind of joy and happiness. 
uh, there are there are those images also present, and that image there is that of a of a tranquil ocean, right? It's it's like a, that's a, that sukha uh, end of suffering is is the the image that he offers is of if there is any positive image is that of an ocean, calm ocean, not a turbulent one, but a calm tranquil peaceful ocean again very different from the the lights that are available in the other world in the imagination uh, of uh, many of the Abrahamic traditions so uh, i think there is uh, there are uh, there are there is a search not for paradise but for something else in the in 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 in, in the in the certain imaginations certainly the buddhist imagination um and the and the the idea of a paradise in 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 religious and secular visions uh i don't see there is much of a difference the only difference is that in the religious in many of the religious secondary religious worldviews this paradise in is in a in a in a completely different world it's not even a loka it's something else whereas uh uh, in in uh, in the secular, it's another another very different world, but it's this world radically transformed. Uh, but but uh, but there are very few descriptions, uh, you know, uh, and and uh, I'm not surprised if we continue to to downgrade imagination and 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 cut imagination of reason and sensual sensual experience, then what we will get are no images of paradise. Thank you. Uh, before we conclude, I do see, uh, just a minute. Uh, so will Sudipto not are, respond? Yes, I, I think we, could I ask both of you a question? You know, there's a question for both of you. Uh, please respond. This is from Arun Kumar Patnaik, who says, uh, excellent talk, Shudhita Even Rajiv's comments were very stimulating. But I have a live question. How will you apply the distinction between Kalpana and Bhavana in the weaver's work of a beautiful cotton bed cover? This is the question for Shudhita, I guess. Uh, but both of you can respond. No, that See is a question to So. Uh, Even that's a question, answer. Yes, but I that's like right. the, that's yeah. Okay. I don't think uh, we should uh, use bhavana in the technical sense, but uh, even in bhavana, you know, what is interesting is that bhavana is from the root bhu to exist, and uh, so bhavati is something that exists, but bhavayati is to make something come into being. But I would not, uh, you know, try excessively to use bhavana in this. I think what is involved here is more kalpana than bhavana. Uh, is there any other question? Otherwise, I would want to say I a few think, words uh, very briefly. No, this is the so, question that has come in. So you could respond to this. That's it. I mean, yeah. No, you know, uh, Rajiv, all your comments are, of course, wonderful. Uh, I wanted to make just a couple of remarks. One is that I think our discussion in India needs to be more attentive to uh, exploration of our own tradition, you know, more deeply. And uh, that is uh, what I'm interested in, because if we look at it closely, I'm of course not very well read except in small uh, bits and parts of it, but the little bit that I have read shows me that there's so much of difference between, let's say, the Upanishadic view. But there is also another Vedic view, which is not Upanishadic quite. In fact, a view which is far more ritualistic, which is far more interested in, you know, a kind of transactional relationship with the deity, etc. So that, then of course, when you turn to the Buddhist, it's extraordinarily different. Uh, it's extremely powerful. But let me tell you one thing, which I do not find very convincing about uh, the Buddhist argument. And I 
I'm not saying that uh, I have a view on this because it's a deep, difficult question. Uh, and I think uh, people who follow Advaita, they also have a similar view. The idea that if you want to get rid of suffering, uh, you have to detach yourself from the object of desire. You know, yes. that is the important thing, that you have to uh, detach yourself from the object of desire. This is also developed quite beautifully and very deeply by Abhinava. He has a very interesting word for this. I can see that the word is very interesting, but I'm not convinced by that. He says that what you try, what you achieve by trying to achieve vairagya, non-attachment, is a sukha, right? Uh, Rajiv, you were also having trouble with this, which I think is, is right. Uh, that what is it that the Buddhists want to achieve? And he, uh, I think he is partly caught in a logical argument that if people desire something, there must be some sukha in that. And look at what he says. He said that the sukha that you achieve by cultivating vairagya is trishna kshaya sukha. You know, trishna is desire, kshaya, cessation of desire, sukha. That actually gives you sukha. I I have thought about it very deeply. I'm not convinced by this because if it says that you know you develop an attitude of kata vakanta karte putra etc you know who is your son who is your uh, wife or lover or something like that my sense is that ultimately there is nothing much to uh, you know there is nothing much which is interesting or valuable or or, or uh, nice in human life if you detach yourself so much from things which are uh, objects of desire but i think i Take your point that you know. I think it is an extremely powerful argument. I know very little about the Buddhists, so that's why I haven't talked about it. What I find very intriguing about the Vaishnava is precisely what they are trying to do about this world and the other world. That Vrindavan is something which is neither this worldly in the ordinary sense of the term. It's also not otherworldly at all in the ordinary sense of the term. So they're trying to conceptualize something which is very interesting, but your other remark is also very powerful, which I think the Vaishnavas, con con I would not say concede, because they are not conceding it to opponents. But this is something which I think they understand very powerfully, that if you want to develop an argument of that kind, you have to do it in two ways. You have to do it through theoretic thinking, which is done by the uh, theological treatises. But if you look at the theological treatises themselves, there's so much of attention to the image. You know, images taken from nature, images taken from human life, images which are images of human gestures, which are beautiful. And they're beautiful precisely because they're transient. And it is only a song. It is only an, uh, you know, a painting image. Or if you're somebody like Kalidas, then it's a word image which can capture that. So I think what you said is very important that you know the uh, uh, we are excessively influenced by modern a certain kind of modern Western thinking. We should not generalize because in the West also there are powerful strands of thought which question this. But this is also something that I find very interesting about the Vashavan, that uh, they are they are their emphasis on the dual importance of the philosophical and the image, uh, which is presented through poetic and, and musical art. Um, and also this idea that, you know, uh, what you should cultivate to be happy is essentially human relationship. So my general point through this is that, you know, we must actually try to turn our attention more systematically through our teaching, through our conferences, through our writing, you know, more intensively towards the heritage of thinking that we have on these questions, which is difficult because, you know, it's partly in Sanskrit, partly in Persian, partly in medieval vernacular, which are not easy to read.
I think yeah. uh, so we have to conclude here. But sure. let me congratulate our uh, speaker, the principal speaker, Professor Shudipta Kobiraj, and also our discussant uh, here today. This was a brilliant discourse, and you know it really fits into the uh, the mode uh, of research that uh, uh, we do in the uh, Jawa in the Center for Jawaharlal Nehru Studies, which is a research center based on the focus is entirely on interdisciplinary uh, and multidisciplinary research. And uh, in this entire series, we've tried our best to get speakers who uh, could uh, you know, look at a point of view or a theme from various perspectives. And that's precisely what uh, Professor Kaviraj has done today. So you know, our ideas about, the, about this particular theme, you know, how paradise is looked at uh, in religious thought and social thought, in political thought, and in diverse uh, you know, modes of uh, art is something that uh, came out today in his uh, discourse. And of course, uh, Professor uh, Bhargav also uh, spoke extensively. You know, he was commenting and giving his observations and comments on Professor Kaviraj's lecture, but also there was some, so much more that he said on uh, the idea of paradise, which has been of perennial concern to sages, philosophers, political thinkers, and uh, uh, even uh, uh, men and women of literature for a very, very long time in both uh, you know, Eastern history as well as uh, Western political or any kind of thinking or thought. So this idea, I think uh, Professor Kaviraj is, uh, you know, he chose the theme which, uh, you know, it, it, it is still so relevant. And especially when we are talking of end of ideology, uh, as a political scientist, as a political thinker, you know, if 21st century is to be, uh, we reinforce this idea of end of ideology, then the question of paradise, you know, in a, in a very, uh, in the most ancient sense in which it was used at one point of time can still be used and reused again in in political thought uh, so therefore this fascinating idea of paradise and the way we can interpret it in diverse modes of thought in diverse religious thought or political thought or uh, state thought you know uh, this i think uh, was really uh, i don't think uh, uh, you know, uh, he's he's exhausted himself. Professor Kaviraj really exhausted himself on this theme, but he's taken on as many aspects of this idea of paradise as he could, and which could lead to further discussions, debates, and so on. Which was the primary idea of doing these lecture series. You know, we started these lecture series in pandemic times. We started the first one on sixth April, and Professor Akil Bilgrami spoke on. Indian secularism and art, and uh, we had to cancel two lectures because of the second wave of COVID infections and what was going on in the campus. Uh, so therefore, even online lectures had to be cancelled. But I'm really happy, really glad that today, uh, this was the concluding lecture of the series. Uh, uh, we could still host the last two lectures this month and then conclude the series. Uh, so I'm happy. I'll be. I mean, we were able to do it in the Center for uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Studies, where we initiated the series and concluded it, of course, within a month. Uh, but uh, I'm really very, very thankful to Professor Kaviraj to have agreed to come today. Uh, and it's interesting that we started the series with uh, Professor Bilgrami, from, who's from the same university um, where Professor Kaviraj teaches. So it's an honor. For Jamia, it's an honor for the Center for Jawaharlal Nehru Studies that we've had these two uh, stalwarts to begin and conclude the series. Uh, so thank you so much, Professor Kaviraj, and of course Professor Bhargav, who we gave, you know we had to invite uh, at a very short notice. And what a wonderful job he's done as a discussant by throwing uh, light on so many other aspects of this topic, which could be taken up. Uh, as a metaphor for uh, not just the ancient idea of paradise, but there are so many new uh, ideas that can be taken up in the 21st century when we think of 
uh, enchantment or uh, disenchantment with existing ideologies and what really can we take up for the future? What is that fascinating one big idea uh, which uh, we could uh, which could be interpreted as the search for paradise. And that, that's really, this has been a fascinating uh, lecture and I'm sure our students, teachers, colleagues, friends in India, uh, from various parts of the world who joined in, this was, must have been a very, very enlightening, uh, very thought provoking discourse on the idea of the search for paradise. Uh, so now I would uh, request uh, Dr. Eti Bahadur to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. The Center for Jawaharlal Nehru Studies, Jamia Millia Islamia, uh, began the interdisciplinary public lecture series in the year 2021. Mm -hmm. I would at the outset like to thank uh, Professor Najma Akhtar, Vice Chancellor Jamia Millia Islamia, for encouraging us to initiate the interdisciplinary lecture public lecture series 2021. Thank you, Madam Vice Chancellor. A special word of thanks to Professor Sudipto Kaviraj, who delivered the lecture today titled A Search for Paradise. I would also like to thank Professor Rajiv Bhargav for his insightful comments and observations on the lecture today. Thank you, Professor Bhargav, for agreeing to uh, join us today at a short notice. I would like to thank uh, the director, uh, Dr. S. Kazim Nakvi, Center for Information and Technology for screening the fourth and the last lecture in the interdisciplinary public lecture series. It has been a pleasure jointly working with the director, Center for Jawaharlal Nehru Studies, uh, Professor Rum uh, Rumki Basu. It would have been impossible for me and for all of us to organize this event without this office uh, support of the Office of Staff of CJNS. I would also like to thank Mr. Wajahadullah Khan for his secretarial assistance. Finally, I would like to thank the audience for their interest and enthusiasm, which also encourages us to host such events in the near future. I thank everyone once again. I would now like to invite Professor Rumki Basu, the Director, Center for Jawaharlal Nehru Studies, to say a few words and declare the public lecture series closed. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, I have to thank our students, our friends, colleagues uh, from Delhi, from every part of India who joined as a part of the audience in the series. When I started the lecture series, I, I had no idea how we could manage this in, in the times of a pandemic. And, uh, you know, the campus, uh, we the hostels were closed, the students were not there. And uh, of course, uh, the administration was functioning, but we, we had all gone online with teaching. But I did feel that if we have an online interdisciplinary lecture series, perhaps we would get the audience that we wish to. And, uh, you know, it would do an honor to the center that uh, we do get in public intellectuals uh, from all parts of India and abroad uh, who would be able to uh, do justice to the center's focus on interdisciplinary themes and research uh, in which, uh, you know, they would be able to tackle a theme, as I just said, uh, from various perspectives. We tried our best to uh, you know, get in as many speakers as we could uh, before the session ends in May. And uh, we had about six speakers in mind and they had all agreed, but two had to uh, be, you know, two lectures were dropped. But somehow I thank our um, Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Najma Akhtar, that when I discussed this lecture series with her, she was very excited very happy to give me the go ahead signal. And that's how we started in the midst of a pandemic, a lecture series, which we didn't know uh, what kind of audience we would evoke. But uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Dr. Najma, our other colleagues, and my colleagues in the center, we are all too happy that our students have joined in. Students have given us full support. They were used to the online mode because of the pandemic times. And so the, uh, you know, the fact that we were hosting these series online 
didn't deter them from joining wherever they are, whichever part of the country they were in. So we had a very, very stimulating series of lectures on religion, on philosophy, on political thought, on, uh, uh, you know, on issues in the public domain, uh, which need to be discussed in India today. So I, I, I really thank all the speakers, all our speakers who came in for this series. Uh, that would that was really uh, you know an honor to us that uh, all of them were contacted at very short notice and told to come and give these lectures to us, which they did. So uh, I'm thankful for honoring us, and I'm thankful to the audience, not only who were present here today, but in these past two months. We started in early April, and this is the end of May. So in these past two months. Uh, despite the second wave of the pandemic, despite all that was going on in India and in Delhi, we had uh, almost a captive audience who stood by us, stood with us. And of course, the Jamia administration, Professor Nagvi, I thank you so much from this uh, forum here today. I mean, it would have been impossible to conduct this series of lectures without your active cooperation and logistic support. And may I announce that all the lectures will be on YouTube. Uh, the links will be given to all of you, the students, and, and it will be put on our website. So all, all lectures that uh, we hosted and uh, we've conducted in this series, they will be on YouTube for, uh, you know, uh, for anyone uh, to uh, see it at leisure and it's best that lectures of these kind are always put in the public domain because they generate a kind of uh, discussion that is absolutely needed in India today. Discussions uh, which most of these speakers have handled wonderfully and they have been stimulating and exciting and exhilarating lectures. So thank you all. Thanks. I thank the audience and I declare uh, with a little tinge of regret perhaps that uh, the 2021 interdisciplinary CJNS interdisciplinary public lecture series to be closed. Thank you so much.